This is really working. I am brilliant. I am a brilliant cook and an incredible hostess for whoever's coming over to eat this casserole. No one's coming over, it's just me. How can I dress up a simple rice and tuna dinner with eye-catching toppings? Betty Crocker's answer, curried tuna casserole. I'm Melinda and I'm cooking my way through Betty Crocker's 1971 recipe card library. Today we're making curried tuna casserole, which is from section S, Hurry Up Main Dishes, and it's card number 16. The reason I picked this card is that mostly based on the aesthetics. I'm obsessed with the decoration on this. It's giving like pie chart. It's giving 1970s color palette. You have these individual wedges of different toppings and I think that looks really cool. Underneath the toppings, we have a very basic tuna casserole, which is kind of a quintessential mid-century dish, right? You know, it's tuna, it's rice, it's these weird mini onions. It's a cream of mushroom soup. You know, you got all your stuff in there, but I think what, what, what Betty's doing is she's put a little spin on it, by making it kind of curry inspired. So let's get started. All right, so the first step to making the curried tuna casserole is to um, let the butter brown in a skillet. So I'm just gonna do that over here. Get in there. And we'll let that melt a little bit. Um, and then I have kind of all the rest of the ingredients in place. I went ahead and halved these mini onions. I don't know why Betty calls for these mini onions, I guess. If I had to guess, it's that they're a bit more mild and they're a bit like pre-cooked um, instead of using kind of a fresh onion, but they are bizarre to me, I won't lie. <laughs> they're very pungent, pungent, but I have them. Also having them seems weird because you're gonna get a big butt of onion, whatever, following the recipe. And then we have, of course, the tuna, the cream of mushroom soup, the milk, and the rice. Now that the butter's melted, I'm gonna add the curry powder and let that kind of steep in the butter a bit. All right, now that the butter is browned and kind of mixed with the curry powder for a bit, it's very aromatic. We're gonna just dump in the rest of the ingredients, nice and simple. So there go the onions, whoa! <laughs> then we're gonna go with the tuna. I'm gonna try to like chunk it with my fork a little bit as I pull it in, because I don't want it to be in too big of chunks. Then we have two and a half cups of rice going in. She didn't tell me what order to do this. <laughs> so I could be doing it wrong. Um, and then we have three quarters of a cup of milk. Milk's going in. Try to break up the rice a little bit. I am using leftover rice, but I think that that is a perfect use for leftover rice in a casserole, right? It's looking nice and curry colored. <laughs> and then the piece de resistance. The thing that makes a tuna casserole a tuna casserole. The Campbell's cream of mushroom soup, of course. There's no smell. I don't know why I smelled it. <laughs> I thought I would learn something. <laughs> all right, let's just mix that all together. And we're gonna have a casserole. This is not the first time I've done a fish-themed curried situation on the channel. I made a curried fish in rice ring, which was kind of like a poached fish in a curry sauce that you served in a rice ring. And now we're doing tuna with curry and rice in a casserole form. I found my baking dish, okay. <laughs> it's going in an ungreased baking dish, which always stresses me out, but fine. <laughs> and oh, let's just dump it in. Oh, you're big and heavy. Oh, you're so heavy. It smells really good. I'm excited. Smoothing it out, smoothing it out. Bake uncovered for 30 minutes. So this is gonna go in a 350 degree oven for 30 minutes and then we'll work on the toppings. All right, it's time to prepare the curry condiments. So Betty Crocker recommends six condiments to go on the top of our casserole. Peanuts, green onions, sieved egg yolks, bacon, currants, and crab apple jelly. Now, where would I find crab apple jelly? Unclear, I couldn't. So a good alternative, according to Google, is plum jelly, so that's what I have instead. Um, otherwise, I have everything, and it's just time to get it all in place. So what I kind of recognize from the front cover is that everything looks 
very, very finely chopped, <laughs> which isn't really something I'm used to doing. I typically have like really big chunky um, toppings and things because I'm just lazy and I'm not good at doing things in a detail oriented way. <laughs> but I'm gonna try a little bit harder to make sure everything I do is really finely chopped, including these green onions. <laughs> I'm just gonna go back over them a million times until they're in tiny little pieces. When I first found this recipe, I i mean, obviously I enjoyed the visual sentiment that Betty was doing here, but I wasn't really clear on why this recipe existed. Like what was her, what was her inspiration? What was her, her thinking behind it? I had never really heard of, of a curry being served this way. And so I did a bit of Googling. I am not a food historian. <laughs> So take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. But um, what I kind of discovered is that in kind of mid-century, there was a popular dish at the time that was kind of a British colonial style curry. And it was usually chicken curry, uh, chicken or turkey, and it was served with rice and with little bowls of condiments. And I think typical condiments, some of these were on the list for sure. Um, I saw bacon, I saw mango chutney, I saw definitely raisins and currants and peanuts and green onion. There are also things like pineapple or coconut or even banana was a cotton topping. So I definitely, I see that this is reminiscent of that style of curry. Now what Betty's doing is basically uh, taking another classic mid-century dish, tuna casserole, and smashing it together with British colonial style curry. <laughs> and this is the result. So it's kind of, that's something Betty Crocker really loved to do is kind of reinvent, mix and match, combine two things that no one's ever combined before. <laughs> two different styles of cuisine. All right, I'm gonna chop the peanuts really small too. Chopping peanuts is hard because I feel like they're gonna fly everywhere. Don't do it, don't do it. I'm really dedicated to getting a nice, even geometric equal wedges you know and i know i'm not capable of that but i can dream okay i can dream all right i have some crumbled bacon already but in the spirit of being stressed out about the size i'm gonna give that a bit of a chop as well oh yeah oh yeah get in there get crunchy one two three oh it's time for the sieved egg yolks <laughs> <laughs> Y'all know I'm not really an egg girl. I don't really eat hard boiled eggs. Preparing these yolks was stressful for me, <laughs> but we're gonna do it. Um, I looked in the Betty Crocker picture cookbook for kind of instructions or tips or advice on how to sieve an egg yolk. And all she said was, you can sieve an egg yolk. And there was a picture of her doing it. I had, there was no, there was no tips. So I'm just gonna maybe smash it with a fork. I don't know, let's let's see here. Let's see what happens. I don't know why I couldn't just crush an egg yolk. Why did I have to sieve it? Well, <laughs> I'm just gonna put them all in, why not? There's a bit of shell, don't go in shell. Sieve, sieve, sieve. I guess it gets it nice and fluffy this way too. Can I just use what's in the sieve? It looks the same as what's on the other side. This reminds me of that, that like toy that's like a magnet dust and then you move the magnet around and it makes a mustache. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? That's the vibe I'm getting. We use canned tuna a lot on this channel and I never really stopped to think about how pervasive it is in mid-century recipes because nowadays, you know, there's rumors of mercury poisoning and drama around the ethics of fishing and like a general lack of perceived freshness. And so I feel like canned tuna has really fallen out of favor. But for over half a century from 1950 to 2000, canned tuna was the most popular seafood in America. And there were over 85% of Americans had it on hand in their cupboards at all times. How? Uh, a change of the tides and a smart marketing campaign. It all started at the turn of the century. And this was back when no one had even tasted tuna. The most popular fish at the time was sardines. Most of these sardines were caught off the coast of California. But in 1903, a change in weather patterns combined with overfishing in the area caused a sardine shortage. And so companies like the California Fish Co. started catching and canning albacore tuna instead. 
Tuna was considered a trash fish with an off-putting flavor, but the company developed a technology to remove the pungent natural oils from the tuna fish and replace it with neutral oils in packaging. This made the tuna pretty bland, but they used that to their advantage in advertising. Early marketing for tuna suggested that it tastes just like chicken, and this was long before the chicken of the sea brand. Um, they shared recipes for casseroles, salads, and sandwiches on their labels and flyers. They also distributed thousands of free recipe booklets, the contents of which were basically just chicken and salmon recipes where they had substituted tuna in its place. But it turns out that the blandness sells. Between the versatility and the price point, Americans were convinced that canned tuna was the best choice for their mid-century meals. The casserole's out of the oven, and I have all of our toppings in place, and I have developed a brilliant strategy for decorating. I cut out the circle that is roughly the interior dimensions here of the casserole, with the goal being I can use it kind of as a template. So I'll hold it up, and that way I'm covering half, and that way I know like, oh, my next topping starts here, and then I could be like, oh, and that's roughly a sixth. I tried to divide a circle <laughs> into six, and I got a little confused. Um, so instead we're just gonna use this kind of to roughly eyeball it, but at least I'll have like a nice straight line that I'm working with, which I'm excited about. So where do we begin? <laughs> I feel like, well, I gotta look at my picture, okay? The top portion here, if it's facing towards me, is the green onion. So I'm gonna kind of do that, maybe, and put the green onions in. I was worried about the amount of topping, but I don't think I have anything to be worried about. <laughs> this casserole's a lot smaller than I thought it would be. So I gotta, I'm just scooching. Scooch, scooch, scooch. The first one is done. Okay, now, next is bacon. So I'm gonna scoot this all the way like this, and then I'm gonna put the bacon in. Wow, this is really working. I am brilliant. I am a brilliant cook and an incredible hostess for whoever's coming over to eat this casserole. No one's coming over, it's just me. But my guests would be impressed if I had guests. <laughs> so that's the bacon quadrant. I wanna save the jelly for last because it's stressing me out. I don't, I don't wanna get my template all covered in jelly. So then we'll do sieved <laughs> egg, which, should I do like a fork with this? I'm, <laughs> I don't wanna touch it. I don't wanna smush it, I should say. It's so fluffy, you know? We work so hard to get it fluffy. No! Don't touch the bacon. That's a separate quadrant. The egg feels like it's less than the other ones. <laughs> Maybe that was intentional subliminably on my part. That looks pretty good. Okay, we have half of it done. Whew. All right, now move it over here. This will be the chopped peanut section. You have to get really careful about when you're going up against the edge ever so gently. I've never been so gentle before in my life. Ever so gently <laughs> tucking ingredients on, into place. Okay, I wasn't perfect, but I think I did a pretty good job, okay? I did a pretty good job. Okay, now we have currants, which are um, also known as more expensive versions of raisins. I had to go to Whole Foods to find them. And they're rather clumpy. Okay, currants are in. And we're gonna do the jam. I'm gonna try to like mix it up a bit so it's easier to move around. Yeah, in retrospect, I probably should have just gotten like a mango chutney, but whatever, this weird plum jam, is that what it is? Golden plum, <laughs> golden plum preserves. Aha! Okay, wait, clean this up. Pull the template off. Ta-da! Wow! Oh my God, I'm so impressed. Can you believe I did this? Look at this. Can you see this? Wow, can you see this? All right, <laughs> it's time to taste. So the obvious thing to do is to have to try all six segments individually to decide which topping is the best topping. So I'm gonna have to go in with my spoon and get six different bites of the casserole. Um, I'll start the green onion because it is literally screaming at me. It is so pungent and saying, eat me, eat me. So let's take a bite. <laughs> I'll just take this big bite with green onion. Mmm, the casserole itself is so good. We get a hint of the tuna, but 
It's not too overpowering. The rice is like tender and creamy. I can taste those canned onions a bit, um, but the curry is really nice. The curry flavor is just very subtle. Mm. In general, I don't love a, a fresh onion taste, so green onion is a topping, not my fave. But I'm gonna go in again with uh, the jam next, I guess. Okay, going in for the jam. Mmm, the jam is really sweet. Complements the curry nicely. I think that's perfect. Ooh, I like that better than the onion. So far, we're increasing in our rankings. Time for the current layer. Mmm, the currants are nice because they have a bit of texture, a bit of crunch, and an otherwise very creamy base casserole. And they have that sweet, complexity, but it's not as sweet as the jam. So for that reason, I almost like that layer more than the jam, but it really does, the sweetness really complements the flavor of the casserole nicely. Okay, now I'm ready for a super crunch with the peanut layer. I keep saying layers, they're not layered, they're, seg they're segments. I'm gonna get full. Mm. <laughs> peanut, also a really nice complement to the curry flavor and the tuna. That's really nice, and the crunch is really is really good. Okay, now into the yolk, probably my least favorite. Take the smallest bite of this one. Hmm, sieved egg yolks don't have much flavor to them. It just has kind of a nice fluffiness. Yeah, I don't know about that one. I feel like it's not really doing much for me. It's not bad, it's just, it's kind of letting me taste the casserole itself a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, finally, the bacon layer. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's really good too. I love the saltiness of the bacon. We didn't put any salt in the casserole. So without these toppings, they'd probably be bland, bland, bland. But I will say the bacon, and maybe it's just the version of bacon I bought. It was like a hickory smoked bacon. Um, it is like giving bacon flavor and it's kind of overpowering the tuna and the curry. So although I love bacon as a topping and that was delicious, <laughs> It more felt like a bacon casserole bite than a curry tuna casserole bite. Wow, okay, all of those were incredible though. Damn, this this is good. I'm, I'm digging in for more casserole. Mmm. Tuna rice casserole is just so easy, creamy, warm. You know, it's a nice base that you can like, as you can see, you can do a lot of toppings and flavors with. Ooh, this was really good. This was really good. Okay, curry tuna casserole. This was so good. I'm so impressed. I think that the casserole itself came together really quickly. You know, I was able to just prepare the toppings while it was in the oven, and by the time it came out, we were good to go. Um, it tasted really good, like classic, like warm and hearty tuna casserole, but having these like other little flavors to play with, it was just so much fun. And it allowed me to try ingredients that I've never tried before. Like I would have never put currants or, uh, plum jam on on a, a casserole. So very kind of out of the box, pushed me a little bit, but the results were absolutely delicious and super fun. So I'm gonna give this one five out of five red spoons. Okay, back in the box. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to check out this video where I make curried fish in rice ring. It was a bit of a mess, but a fun episode. <laughs> um, and if you haven't already, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and until next time, happy homemaking.